Hello and welcome to Faces of History, um, one of my favorite classical conversation events of all time. My name is Shannon Wilson and along with Julie Sisk, I tutor the Essentials class. And for those of you who are not familiar with Essentials, um, this is a group of fourth and sixth grade students who work tirelessly on grammar and writing skills every Thursday afternoon for two hours together and then throughout the week at home. And I have got to brag on these students. They show more creativity, enthusiasm, and tenacity than any group of students I have ever known. They are just very, very special. And I think you'll agree with me after you hear them tonight. Faces of History is one of my very favorite programs because um, often our eight-year-old son will ask me, Mom, if you could have any superhero power, what would it be? And he wants me to give a different answer every time, but I always say, I would time travel. And that is the truth. If I could choose any power, it would be time travel. I would love to watch Joan of Arc lead in her courageous French. I would love to see Michelangelo painting. I would love to watch the fightings of the Crusades and so many, so many events that you will hear more about tonight. Um, these students have done their own research, they have done their own writing, and they have done mostly their own costuming. And tonight you will have a survey of beginning with 484 BC all the way to modern times. I want you for just one minute to close your eyes and think about yourself as a fourth, fifth, or sixth grader. So you got that image? Okay, now imagine that your teacher has asked you to research and write a five paragraph paper. And now imagine that your teacher has asked you to stand up in front of a large group on a tall stage in front of a microphone and deliver that paper. So how do you feel? Well, one of my other children has coined the phrase Nervex. And she always says, Mom, I feel really Nervex, which is so nervous and so excited. And um, I know that's how a lot of our students feel tonight. We've all admitted that we're all a little nervous. I'm a little nervous up here, guys. And nerves are your friends. So I just want to remind them and invite them to enjoy every moment of this culmination and to really enter into their character and take the stage and celebrate all the hard work that they've put in already. Um, one of the things that we also work on is being an excellent listener. And so tonight, um, I want you to practice listening for strong verbs and quality adjectives and really impressive opening sentences and hooks and decorations and dress-ups because that's what makes Essentials and our writing program really special. Um, we take what would be a mundane subject and turn it into a, a very doable and practical exercise and then by the end it's really a beautiful, beautiful production. So I invite you just to join us, to relax, to listen and to uh, take a little trip through the Middle Ages with us. Thank you. Everyone knows Christopher Columbus was the first European to discover America, but can he really claim that title? I am Brenda the Navigator, a sailing monk who fearlessly set off from Irish shores to conquer the Western Unknown 900 years before Columbus. My voyage became my legacy. I was prepared for it from my youth. The adventures were treacherous and my story spread. For my whole life, I was being prepared by God to go on a trip into the unknown. I was born in 484 when a colossal fire devoured the forests near my home. My people proclaimed it was a sign from God to give me to the church. After I became a monk and then a priest, my mentor, Brother Irk, took me sailing around Ireland to preach the wonders of the everlasting promise of the gospel. During one of these voyages, I he we heard tell of a promised land which was far to the west, deep into the unknown, and equal in beauty to Eden. They called it Tirnanog. I, called, I decided to voyage beyond the horizon. Trustingly, as Irk laid on his deathbed, he passed on his golden cross and sailing charts to Tirnanog. I resolutely built a ship called a Kuruk with a wooden frame wrapped tightly in oxide sealed with animal fat. I christened her the Irk. We fasted and prayed and was finally prepared for a trip into the great western unknown. The currents of the sea and the wind carried my small craft north, where strange adventures lurked behind every wave. 
Once, when, when we beached our ship on a small island, the island began to churn and sank down to the depths. A pillar of crystal, which floated serenely on the surface of the water, broke apart and smashed into our ship. A monk fell. The waves devoured him. He rose. A gigantic whale ascended from the deep and saved the monk. Fiery giants ferociously hurled flaming balls into the sea. The ocean boiled. Pleasantly, birds called down psalms from above as an island came into view. Could this be paradise? We discovered we were not the only humans in this land when some men, who appeared to be painted, came to us. I passed on the cross that Earth had passed down to me. Soon after this, I had a vision telling me to return home. All the monks joined me on the Earth, and we set sail, following the currents home, through the perilous, adventure-filled seas. The mystery of my intrepid journey, which held myriads of adventures, became my legacy. It had been seven long years of sailing since I had set foot in my homeland. As soon as I landed, my story raged through Ireland like the wildfire that brazenly raged through the woods on the day I was born. When I was 93 years old, I died in 577. After hundreds of years, my story and I became embellished legends before they were written down for the first time. Is this a myth? No one really knows, but a young man by the name of Tim Severin was determined to find out. Eagerly, he gathered a crew of four friends in 1976 and built a crook in the same manner that I would have. He set off. He followed the currents. He found Tiernanog. He coasted past volcanoes and icebergs, heard the cries of seagulls carried by the wind, and saw gigantic whales. Could these have been my fiery giants, crystal pillars, speaking birds, and sea monsters? Following what could have been my route, he passed Iceland and Greenland and soon landed in Newfoundland, Canada, proving that the legends could all be true. The legacy of my prominent adventure remains a mystery. I was prepared for it from my youth, for a voyage beyond the horizon. My voyage was full of adventures. The legends of my voyage became my legacy, which would last through generations. I, Brenda the Navigator, was a sailing monk who, according to legend, discovered America 900 years before Christopher Columbus. Would you believe that a hammer could stop the wind? In the early 1700s, an army of Saracens, a name for Muslim warriors, swept across North Africa, conquering the peoples and spreading Islam. Their general led them up into Spain, where he ordered them to burn their ships, saying, We conquer or perish. After they annihilated the Spanish armies, they boasted, We are like a mighty wind, which no one can stop. Yet they had not yet, me they had not yet met me. <laughs> Charles the Hammer. Although I was not king, I ruled as mayor of the palace. I spared Western Europe for Christianity by defeating the Saracens at the Battle of Tours. Diligently, I accomplished many other great deeds and left a lineage of godly kings after me. From, nine, from yeah, 639 to 751, the kingdom of the Franks was ruled by a family of weak kings called the Do-Nothings. The job <laughs> the job and title mayor of the palace was passed down much like kingship. We mayors managed all the affairs that the king should have. The king cared more for sport and entertainment than ruling their kingdom. The mayors waged war, raised money, spent on the state, and managed the government. By the time my father Pepin served as mayor of the palace, the kingdom included most of France and some of Germany. I fought to help him conquer the Nev Netherlands and earned a reputation for knocking people down in battle. Here I earned my title Martel, which means hammer. When my father died in 714, I became mayor of the palace. I continued to defend our kingdom, defend the kingdom from our enemies, the fiercest of which was the Saracens. I led my people courageously during the reign of the do-nothing kings. While protecting my country, I protected all of Europe at the Battle of Tours. The Muslim general Tariq bin Ziyad 
had led a proud army across North Africa into Spain. Eventually, they crossed the Pyrenees Mountains into southern France. While the Saracens attacked and plundered villages, Tariq was slain and Abdur Rahman took over. I was not idle. Speedily, I mustered an army of Franks and Germans and marched toward the Saracens who had encamped near Tours. In, 730, in 732, I arrived, but for six days our armies only occasionally skirmished. On the seventh day, we battled with terrible earnestness. The Saracen general was killed. The soldiers fled the battlefield to protect their plunder. The Frankish victory at the Battle of Tours is known as a decisive battle in European history. After that victory, I accomplished many other great deeds and left behind a heroic heritage. Because the Saracens did not leave immediately, I continued to fight until I drove them back over the Pyrenees. Europe extolled me as the champion of Christianity. Upon my death in 741, my courageous son Pepin succeeded me as mayor of the palace. He was not content to be mayor, so he sent friends to the Pope with a message. They asked, who should be king, the man with the title or the man who has all the power and performs all the duties? The Pope replied, certainly, the man who has the power and performs the duties. So the Pope gave his consent, and the mayor of Vinci and do-nothings were removed from the throne. My accomplishments and popularity led to my son becoming king and my grandson, another Charles, becoming the most renowned ruler of the Middle Ages. The mayors of the palace, like me, did the ruling and work for the do-nothing kings. When the Saracens attacked Tours, I defended our land and accomplished and my accomplishments helped Europe and my descendants become, become great kings. Most significantly, I stopped the Muslim army, allowing Christian culture, rather than Islamic, to spread and flourish throughout Europe. The hammer of God had beaten back the wind of Allah. <laughs> I am Beowulf the Gate, crusher of foes, slayer of giants, and wrestler of sea monsters. I have come to tell you one of my greatest adventures, involving a dragon. Courageous, my courage, success, and defeat mark my path as a warrior and king. After I had defeated Grendel and his mother, I encountered a dragon and a loyal citizen. During my reign over the eights, a terrible sly servant slipped away from slavery and ran into a cave, which was full of unspeakable amounts of gold. Inside, an un indestructible dragon lay atop the piles and piles of gold. The slave stole one of its precious cups. The dragon became enraged spewing massive bolts of fire and emerged from its gargantuan cave. Flying over the nearest town, it burned every house, hoping to hit the insolent thief as well. Unfortunately, it hit the wrong house. I emerged from my hut, screaming curses and death wishes at the wanton dragon. Scrambling frantically up the hill, I sent for my 14 loyal men to destroy the massive dragon. When we reached the cave, I yelled, come and fight me like a man. The dragon shot a ball of tenacious fire at me, but I had a magical shield with which I blocked the flames. As the soldiers were watching from a distance, they hastily broke into a run and fled. Only one man named Big Luff headed for the dragon, brandishing his sword courageously. While he was charging, I boldly swung my sword at the dragon's armor. It shattered into two pieces. The dragon used this moment to grab my neck with its pointy jaws. Fortunately, I had a mighty neck, so the dragon had only <coughs> pierced my skin. Wiglaf opportunistically carved, carved into the dragon's soft spot, only its only vulnerability, piercing his heart. I began to succumb to the dragon's poisonous bite. I gravely died 
Wiglaf was crowned king. The loyalty of Wiglaf was rewarded with a piece of the dragon's treasure. I, Beowulf, fought, ruled, and died a hero. Does anyone really know who I am beyond that history sentence in 800 AD? I lived from 739 to 814 AD and lived in the expanding Frankish Empire, which is France today. European knighthood started with me. I crave learning, wanting to learn Latin, writing, and reading. My renowned family, though probably not as famous as I, would change the world. Resolutely, I believe that a Christian education was key to knowing God. <clears throat> On Christmas Day in 800 AD, I, the Pope crowned me Holy Roman Emperor of Europe. The Carolinian period, whose origin is from the world Char where Charles became a superior dynasty. Charles Martel, my grandfather, ruled magnificently. Righteously, Charles Martel, which means Charles the Hammer in French, ruled the Franks. Pepin the Sort, which means Pepin the Younger, was my father and was crowned king of the Franks while my 12-year-old self reverently watched. My first son, Pepin the Hunchback, was nicknamed Gobo because of his hunched back, and his inheritance to the throne was sadly cast aside. People laughed at him. Kings did not be mocked. Because my, <coughs> because my first son could not inherit, my second son, Carl, rose to the throne. On my command, my son Gobo was even stripped of his original name, Pepin, and it was given to Carloman or Pepin, and it was given to Carloman, my third son. Louis the Pious, my fourth son, and Pepin or Carloman were given two meager countries to rule. <coughs> Their Carolinian period was a superior dynasty years before and after me. Because I strived to make the Frankish kingdom a Christian nation, it became a prosperous empire. I fostered schools and libraries so that my kingdom would prosper as an empire of learning. Graciously, my school's opportunities were not exclusive to only the sons and daughters of nobles. In my schools, peasants were given the same attention. Many of my royal peers were literate. Capably, I could speak the noble language of Latin fluently, thanks to a famous monk named Alcuin. Not only did I focus, focus on education, but also I valued Christian teachings. Prisoners of war were forced to be baptized or die. I ordered parents to attend church with their children so that the young people in my kingdom would grow up as Christians. I created one of the most colossal Christian empires ever. A month and a day before Christmas, when I was around 60, I traveled to visit the Pope. For that month, I acted calmly and wisely. The Pope noticed. Few did not believe that I was the greatest man in the world. In 800 AD, on Christmas Day, I solemnly prayed at the altar at St. Peter's, which contained church artifacts. I was dressed in a simple toga and hand sandals to humble myself. I felt something cold. Pope Leo III placed a glowing, glittering gold crown of an emperor on my head. Boldly, he proclaimed that I was the Holy Roman Emperor of Europe. It was a reminder of the glory days of Rome, its wealth, its power, its safety, its glory. All hoped that Rome would be as I mean, Europe would be as great as Rome once was on that Christmas day. The famous family is a legend. Both my ancestors and my descendants, because we shaped history. I forged a Christian, civilized, and educated empire. I was crowned the first Holy Roman Emperor of Europe by Pope Leo III. Because I was devoted to making my kingdom as great as Rome once was, as great as Rome once was, both educated and civilized, then my people could be free to learn about God. Hopefully, now you knew me as more than just the Charlemagne of your history sentence. I was the only king in English history to be called the Great. During my childhood, I was the youngest and therefore had no chance of becoming king. I also fought gallantly against the Danish Vikings, who were fetid robbers during my reign. After the war, I gave my subjects the things that they deserved, art and literature. As the greatest English king, I was my people's favorite. My childhood was difficult because I was the youngest out of six children. My father, who was an unrivaled king, was King Ethelwolf ruler of Wessex, 
the kingdom I would inherit someday. I was born in 849 AD, and in my early years, I desired immensely to outdo my brothers and stun my mother, winning her praise. I traveled to Rome twice, where I was honored by the Pope. My childhood was also plagued by sickness and the insecurity of my position. Since I was the youngest, I should never inherit the throne. I could neither read nor write, but I memorized poetry as it was read to me. Sadly, all of my brothers were dead by 871 AD, and I became king at the age of 22. I grieved my brothers. As the youngest child of King Ethelwolf, I, Alfred the Great, became king of Wessex. I am famous for the great war that I fought against the Danish Vikings, who had become brutally warlike and were raiding Anglo-Saxon land. In 878 AD, which was the year that my troops were scattered, Guthrum, who was a wanton, merciless Viking, left Gloucester, which was in Mercia, to attack Wessex. When I desperately fled to Dorset, I hid with a small troop. However, it was my bravery and skill and military forces that halted the invading. My victories against the Danes encouraged myriads of Anglo-Saxons to join my barracks secretly. For seven weeks, I schemed with the leaders of Somerset, Wiltshire, and Hampshire. Finally, after 10 days of fighting at Eddington, I defeated the Danes. Alliances were formed, Vikings were defeated, legends were growing. My victories may have been exaggerated. The Great War was one of my numerous accomplishments. I had countless impressive effects on art and literature. I resolutely gathered English and foreign clerics, who were educated men, to translate works of literature from my people in Wessex. In 887 AD, I learned how to read and write Latin, and I translated several major Latin works from my loyal subjects. I restored art and literature to the people whose lands was destroyed by the Danish raids. I created a set of laws, and I wrote the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was a record of my people. Because it was the first history of the Anglo-Saxons, it was a treasured book. Amazingly, my creativity, knowledge, and energy increased during my final years. I was content. Upon my peaceful, pleasant passing in 899 AD, I was honored by, the, by my former subjects for being a selfless monarch because I restored art and literature to Wessex. My position as the youngest child dumped loads of insecurity on my shoulders, and the war offered a heavy burden of in injuries. Luckily, everything I gave to my subjects paid off upon my death. My name is Alfred the Great, and I was King of Wessex. I rose from disputed heir to the English throne to conquer to the man who changed England forever. I am William, Duke of Normandy, and I was the heir to the English throne. Since Edward the Confessor had no sons, he clearly desired that I should inherit the throne. I had married his beautiful sister, so I was a relative. In 1053, Harold Godwinson became a prominent advisor to Edward. Later, Harold visited me at my castle in Normandy, where he promised to support my receiving of the throne of England. However, in 1066, I was out hunting when one of my nobles came rushing to me, saying, Edward the Confessor has died, and the English have chosen Harold as successor. I felt astonished. Harold, who had not kept his promise to me, had become king. So... I gathered 60,000 men and enough boats to hold them all. I was the true heir to the English throne, and I was willing to fight tenaciously for my rights. After I sailed across the English Channel, I landed in England near Hastings, ready to battle for my crown. Harold and his army, which had been in London, had to march southeast for a whole week. Finally, they reached Hastings, fatigued by the constant march. My army was fresh and ready to fight. Harold cleverly camped on low hills for better ground, thinking I would not charge uphill to fight. However, Harold was surprised. On October 14, 1066, my Normans stormed uphill toward the English camp. At first, my army seemed doomed to fail, but we kept fighting. 
Eventually, I was jostled off my horse, and my soldiers started to panic. I hastily jumped up and shouted, I am alive. We will still conquer yet. The fierce Normans began to fight even harder. As the sun set, Harold was shot by a proficient archer. Harold died. The Saxons retreated. We cheered. We Normans had won the Battle of Hastings, and I was crowned on Christmas Day, earning the title William the Conqueror. After my conquest, I brought many Norman nobles to England, and with them rippled many changes. Because the rich, important, and educated people spoke French, the English language changed. Consequently, my, many French words became mixed in, like beef, garden, and castle. As the king, I gifted land to Norman lords, who bestowed land on knights who loyally protected and served them. Grudgingly, peasants worked this land to raise food for the lords, the knights, and themselves. This new way of life was called feudalism. The system of virtues and manners known as chivalry also developed with these Norman knights. Before the Normans taught the English to construct sturdy stone castles, the English had lived in wood and mud houses. In 1087, I grew ill and died, but my conquest had brought many changes to England that continue today. Climbing from controversial air, I, William the Conqueror, altered English culture forever. Are you as generous as Robin Hood? I am he, the one who gave gold pouches to the needy. I don't mean to brag, but I loved my life. I was an outlaw. I convinced many strong and benevolent men to enter my band. I outsmarted my worst enemy and pledged allegiance to my king until my death. Join me and my merry men, will ya? Strolling through the woods one clear warm day, I, Robin Hood, set out on an adventure to find the unfriendly sheriff, my enemy, who detests me. I led a group of outlaws, my merry men, who stole money from rich people and delivered it to the poor. I walked and walked and walked until I noticed a log that crossed over a stream. And suddenly, a seven-foot man stepped along the log. Let the better man cross first, I bellowed. Well, then you should let me go first, spewed the tall stranger. Then we will fight on the log. Whoever knocks the other into the stream is the winner, I declared. Taking blow after blow after blow after blow, we fought. After many hours, the colossal man knocked me into the stream. I honestly exclaimed, you are a skilled fighter. And I blew my horn, for my whole clan came clamoring. My merry men, here is a fierce fighter that knocked me off the log. Speaking to the tall stranger, I asked, how would you like to join me and my people and me? Join Robin Hood and his merry men, he replied. It would be an honor. My name is Little John, and I will be your best man. After many battles with Little John by my side, we heard a rumor that my enemy, the sheriff of Nottingham, was trying to rat me out. He planned to do this by hosting a shooting contest. The sheriff knew that, w that I would overlook the prize of a golden arrow, and boy, was he right. Disguised as a one-eyed man, I entered the shooting match. Competing against 19 other villagers, I ready myself. The sheriff of Nottingham furiously watched the competition, wrongly assuming that I had not entered the contest. When the single-sided man surprisingly won, the sheriff didn't know it was I, Sly Robin. As I returned to Sherwood Forest, holding my golden arrow, I stopped, thought, and wrote a letter explaining to the sheriff that the one-eyed man was yours truly. The sheriff of Nottingham lost much of his power when King Richard of England returned from the Crusades. The king disguised himself as an opulent abbot. He desired to meet the true Robin before he revealed himself. When he met me, I treated him to a feast, but not without a prize. After we feasted, we competed. 
To my great surprise, this religious man was as strong as two burly grizzly bears, and he easily outmatched me. At once, he took off his disguise and proclaimed, Come with me and my guards, and be my guards because of your proficient archery skills. I proudly left Sherwood Forest. I married May Marion. We had two sons. Sadly, the plague took my love. After King Richard died, I snuck back to the forest and reformed my band. Shortly after that, a raging infection from an untreated wound made me sick. Little John and Will Stutely took me to get help from the priors. I will take him, but you must go so he can rest, she lied. She wickedly cut my arm and I woke up. What are you doing to me? Rest, rest, the pain will go away. Truthfully, she was the sheriff's daughter and she wished me to die. Little John and Will Stutely rushed up. Robin is resting, don't go in, whispered the priors. I'm going to check it out, said Little John. But the door was closed and locked. He kicked the door open. Little John saw blood. He wept in pain. Lying in the bed, I said, Give me a bow and I will shoot my last arrow. Wherever this arrow lands shall be my grave. Once I shot my last arrow, I fell back in the bed dead. Through the years, Little John proved to be my best friend and warrior. At the famous shooting match, I was most nervous, but I won. In my latest days after King Richard died and after my days of being an archer and caring for the poor, my life that I love ended with my last arrow. It is not for glory we fight, but for freedom alone. Scotland revolted, armies were defeated, a spider succeeded. A man of legend rose to claim the throne of Scotland. I am Robert the Bruce, a famous Scottish king. I was born on July 11th, 1274. My parents, Marjorie and Robert de Bruce, Earl of Carrick, were a distant relation to Scottish royal family. My family received great privileges from the English kings. I grew up to be a strong leader and warrior. Despite my previous privileges, I joined William Wallace in Scotland's revolt against the English control. Whereas the English executed William Wallace in 1305, I became a guardian of Scotland. I continued to gain my countrymen's support and eventually amassed a small army. We fought five battles against the English, each ending in our defeat. In 1306, I was secretly crowned King of Scotland, though I hid from the English for several years after. I gained momentum by taking back many castles. Legends state that while in hiding from the English, I, spot, I stopped in my hut and noticed a spider spinning its web between two beams. The spider attempted to swing from one beam to the other and failed. Five times it failed. Five times the English had defeated my army. If the spider possessed courage to try again, I would also. The spider tried again and succeeded. Like the spider, I took courage and marched with my army of approximately 6,000 men against Edward II of England at the Battle of Bannockburn. As David fought Goliath, my army fought the giant army of England and won used, using guerrilla warfare tactics. When the clangs of the swords died away, many more English had fallen on the battlefield than Scottish. The, the number of deaths is unknown. In 1328, through the Treaty of Edinburgh, Edinburgh Edward III of England recognized me as Scotland's king and Scotland as a free country. This, the following year, I died in Cardoss Castle at the age of 54. I am a Scottish legend who left a legacy of courage free, and freedom, and my spider encounter teaches us that maybe spiders aren't that scary.
I would rather die than to do something which I know to be a sin or against God's will. In 1411, four days after Christmas, I was born in France during the Hundred Years' War. My town was solidly loyal to the French King Charles VII, even though we were surrounded by the English. Frequently, our houses were burned and robbed, but we maintained our allegiance to the French King, who was the legitimate king. God began to call me to serve France. I became the spiritual leader and inspiration of the French people. I was captured, tried, and executed. Although I was poor and illiterate, my passion was to serve the king. My name, Joan of Arc. When I was 13 years old, God began to call me to serve France. I was working in the garden and heard voices from angels. I was intimidated by the visions, but then I became very attached to the angels' visits. My angels, the angels tenderly told me devastating stories of the bloody, brutal battles. I knew God had a mission for me. I would fight for France. I intended to run away with soldiers. Because my dad had a dream warning him of my plan, he told my brothers to drown me if I ever did. When my dad scheduled an arranged marriage, I vowed never to marry. God called me to go to Vaucouleurs, where my cousins live, to ask their governor to give me armed guards to escort me through enemy territory to go see the king. Unfortunately, he declined. I returned home. During months of being home, I grew anxious, and I traveled back to Vaucouleurs. A rumor spread that a girl would save France. The governor, who continued to refuse me, finally agreed. I dressed and cut my hair to look like a man because a girl would be an easy target for attack. God opened a door for me to serve France. Over time, I became the spiritual leader and inspiration of the French people. On our dangerous mission through English territory, I traveled with six men. When we arrived safely in French territory, people who were from all over gathered to see me. Legend has it that I was walking past a guard and he made a rude remark about me. I snapped back that he was mocking God so near his death. Later that night, he jumped into the moat and drowned. After I arrived at King Charles' castle, he tested me for months because he did not trust me or my visions. I was very anxious to fight at Orleans. The king finally accepted me, and we marched towards Orleans. When we arrived, Orleans was surrounded by English troops. I, ins I inspired my fellow soldiers to push onwards, even though I was wounded. The English retreated long enough for King Charles to be crowned at the cathedral in Reims. During the coronation, I held my banner high, for it had earned its glory. It had been with me in battle. I awakened the courage of the French, but war was still on the move. On September 8th in Paris, we confronted the English, English troops. People knew that it was I waving my flag, encouraging the soldiers, and killing no one. Eventually, the English were defeated at the Siege of Orleans. The French people were inspired by my spiritual leadership till victory. After only a year of serving, I was captured, tried, and executed. My visions told me that my end was near. Trying to deliver a city under siege, my soldiers were forced to go back into the city walls. The drawbridge was raised before I could enter. An English soldier grabbed me by the cloak, pulling me off my horse. I was now a prisoner. The English were thrilled because I was the cause of their loss, so they sent me to be tried in the church court, the Inquisition. If I was convicted of witchcraft, King Charles could not be king. At the trial, they asked me trick questions, and they tried to confuse me. With God's help, I answered the questions unerringly. And the court was stupefied. You can still read the transcripts today. In the end, I was sentenced to life in prison with two charges. One for wearing men's clothes. Two for claiming knowledge that only belonged to God. They shaved my head. They gave me a dress. They put me in chains. Because the soldiers found me wearing my men's clothes in my cell, they decided that I would immediately be burned on a stake in the town. What a miserable way to die. I wore women's clothes and a hat that had written on it, heretic, relapsed apostate, idolatrous. After the sermon, I prayed out loud to God. This has touched many, this touched many people's hearts. A priest brought out a crucifix and cried, we have killed a saint. After being captured and having an unfair trial, I was executed in a horrific way. I chose to die doing God's will. 
God opened a door for me to serve France. The French people were inspired by my spiritual leadership till victory. After being captured and having an unfair trial, I was executed in a horrific way. As I was being burned, I called for a cross. When the priest brought it out, I cried, hold it high so I may see it through the flames. Now keep it there, always in my sight, until the end. Have you ever wondered who paved the way from John's famous voyage around the world? I, Bartholomew Diaz, ran the southernmost tip of Africa during a frightening storm. Many world leaders during the 1400s were seeking to explore new trade routes and untapped resources of new lands. I, along with many other brave seamen, made tra treacherous journeys in search of glory, glory and fame. I, who ran the Cape of Hope, worked on building new expedition ships and gave my ultimately gave my life for exploration. After 10 months of tiring exploration in August 1487, King John sent me sailing along the African coast with three ships. I did this to chart how long it would take to get from Portugal to the part of, bottom part of Africa. I sailed peacefully until I came upon a storm where the waves seemed to attack my ships. I was in the tropic, tropic, I was in the tropics when the storm had hit, but I didn't know where I was after the storm had passed. King John had taught me and my crew to read, read the midday sun but the storm had raged for 13 days, so we couldn't measure lat lat so we couldn't measure our latitude without any sun. When the storm had subsided, when the storm had subsided, bleh, when the storm had subsided, I sailed east for myriads of days without any sight of land. Then I decided to sail north and found the coast going west to east. I had sailed around Africa's Africa's tip without even knowing I had done so. When I returned to Portugal in 1488, I had been away for 16 months and 17 days. King John vowed to go on more expeditions, even though it was treacherous. To not frighten other sailors, King John thoughtfully renamed the Cape of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. I played an important role in Vasco da Gama's expedition. I oversaw, the, I oversaw the making ships larger and stronger than previous expedition ships. The early ships had square sails, with a new design included triangle sails, which made them faster in open water. I accompanied da Gama on the first part of his voyage to the Cape Verde Islands, Cape Verde Islands before leaving Da Gama's fleet for the northeast of South America. In 1500, I went, I went on one last voyage, but I only commanded one of the 13 ships that sailed together under Pedro Cabral. Next month, my fleet headed into another storm near the Cape Good Hope. Four ships were lost, and one of them was mine. I died while running at the Cape Good Hope, but I am famous for finding it. I escaped death once before, but not that time. While, while on a mission for King John of Portugal, I discovered and rounded the Cape of Hope, which uh, I discovered and rounded the Cape of Storms, which was later renamed the Cape Good Hope. After my famous voyage, I worked diligently to improve the design of expedition ships. I perished while rounding the Cape of Hope for the second time. I remember throughout history as a great sailor who rounded the Cape of Hope for the first time. I paved the way for future expeditions around the world. I was willing to give up my life for a new knowledge of the world. There is talented, and then there's me. <laughs> Although I experienced a less than ideal childhood, it surprisingly led me down a path of breathtaking artistic creations and impressive scientific discoveries years ahead of my time. My name is Leonardo da Vinci, and I love to party. <laughs> my life is proof that a person's childhood is capable of bringing both harm and opportunity to one's future. Born in the small town of Vinci on April 15, 1452, I was unwanted by both my peasant mother and businessman father, who mostly left me to be raised by my elderly grandparents. In case you are unaware, da Vinci means from Vinci, and hence where I derived my last name. My parents were not married, and therefore I was not allowed to attend public school or university. However, this also had a positive effect on my life. Parents of that time period typically forced children to learn their family business. Being that I came from unwed parents, this was not allowed, which actually granted more freedom for my future. Although my father's presence was scarce throughout my childhood, it was his connections that ultimately led to an apprenticeship with Verrocchino, the most famous artist in Florence. This was the true beginning 
my distinguished career in painting. Despite finishing less than a dozen paintings throughout my, my life, my work became some of the most renowned art of all time. Several of my paintings took, took years to create. I always felt a good painter has two chief objects to paint, man and the intention of his soul. This belief led to my desire to show movement and expression in my subjects. In order to depict this accurately, I earnestly studied the human anatomy through dissection. Unlike other artists of my time, each of my paintings are all noticeably different, which is obvious in my three most famous works, The Mona Lisa, The Last Supper, and The Vitruvian Man. Although I enjoyed painting for a time, my interest in other subjects, including botany, hydraulics, and physics, eventually captured more of my attention. With hopes of constructing a type of encyclopedia, I began recording all of my findings and ideas. After studying and sketching on limitless sheets of handmade paper, I bound them into notebooks. I wrote with both hands. I wrote backwards. I wrote over 13,000 pages. From flying machines to zoology sketches to military devices, I documented all of it. Sadly, being over 500 years old, countless pages crumbled and only 6,000 still exist today. My notebooks are a fascinating record of my unparalleled mind. In the end, my difficult adolescence also served several opportunities many children were not granted. My painting career, though successful, ultimately led to many other fields of study captured in my prize notebooks. My mind was a serious machine. But don't let that fool you. This polymath loved to party.
It's not on. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. Sorry, that was too loud. Go ahead and take your seats again. We'll get ready for our second half. Thank you so much. Do you want me to go ahead and announce that now? Okay. We have one substitution. We have a couple students that didn't make it today last minute. Um, and for one of them, for Annalise Johnson on your program, her sister is standing in for her. So how fun is that? Have you ever heard of abominable and atrocious adolescents saying Bloody Mary three times in the mirror of a bathroom? Well, I'm a lot more than that, and I will tell you why. I am a faithful Catholic who knows no boundaries regards to protecting the papacy. If you disagree with me, no problem. I will immediately behead you. Also, I do not like Protestants like my sister, Elizabeth. And now I will tell you why. I am a faithful Catholic. I, be, I perform a secret mass four times a day. I became accustomed to the secrecy during my father's reign because my father detested Catholics. However, during my reign, I tried to quickly convert all Protestants in England into Catholics. Therefore, all my countrymen look up to me, and those who don't, don't matter. If a Protestant disagrees with me, I will behead them. During my brutal reign, if, if Protestants did not agree to change into a Catholic, I swiftly beheaded or hung them. That is how I got the nickname Bloody Mary, which is likely what you know me as today. But not to worry, I did not watch the people being, being beheaded or hung, because I'm far too busy with good Catholic works like building monasteries. I despise Elizabeth, my slithering snake of a sister. I'm happy to say Elizabeth and I have a terrible relationship. In short, she is a Protestant. Because of this unbelievable life choice, I locked Elizabeth in a dungeon for three months. That's not all we argue about, though. Elizabeth, Elizabeth endlessly fights with me regarding the throne, for which she is next in line. As you can see, I'm much better than those pessimistic fools in the mirror think. I'm very faithful and will never stop bravely fighting for Catholicism. I will behead you if you say anything that I don't like. That includes you, my darling sister. Just remember, if you would like to know more about me, all you have to do is creep into a dark bathroom and call me Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. <laughs> I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I love and yet am forced to seem to hate. I do yet dare not say I ever meant. I seem stark, mute, but inwardly do pray. I am and I seem stark. Oh, sorry. I am and not. I freeze and yet am burned. Since from myself uh, another self I turned. My care is like my shadow in the sun. Follows me flying, flies when I pursue it. Stands and lies by me, doth what I have done. This seems to be my plight in life, my contradictory legacy. What I like to recount is that I single-handedly defeated the Spanish Armada. With not one of our boats hit, I might add. Everyone talks about my sister Mary because of her desire for the spotlight. But it is I... It is I who quietly stood as the greatest queen of England has ever seen. Most importantly, I stood fashionably, the most important virtue. <laughs> I consider this a greater feat in life than defeating the Spanish Armada. The Spanish Armada began when I refused to marry Philip II, who later became Mary's husband. Philip wanted to rule England, and my, den and my denial for the in my denial for him, led to him marrying 
Mary, and a power play for his Spanish Armada. However, he underestimated my forceful fleet that my father bestowed upon me before he passed. Because of these powerful ships, I defeated Spain without a single loss to king or country. This led to very awkward family dinners. Mary's husband, Prince Philip II, who was Spanish royalty, wanted to rule over England. However, we, the English, knew that that would be disastrous. Moreover, only over my dead body would England have a Catholic king and queen, at least not for long. Some townspeople tried to form a rebellion against Mary and Philip's union, but the noblemen, noblemen that planned it were executed. Mary thought I had something to do with it, so she decided to lock me in a tower. I was petrified because that's how my mother died. Later, Mary was awakened to the truth and finally released me, but I was the lucky one. Spoiler alert, my sister was given the term of endearment, Bloody Mary, because she burnt over 300 people because they were not being Catholic. You know what they say, what comes around goes around. This was the perfect reason to exert my power and revenge. I locked Mary in a tower for months for many illegal acts against Protestants, but mostly so that I could finally reign as my God-given birthright. Upon Mary's death, I finally became queen. Now that we have covered the more trivial pursuits of my life, such as world wars, spreading Catholicism, and becoming queen, I'd like to, like to tell you about my real legacy, fashion. I dressed very elegantly. Not only did I rule with panage, but the people of my court also dressed chic, but smelled terrible. <laughs> this was because people in the Middle Ages did not bathe or wash their clothes often. However, they covered up their putrid smells with sharp and on symbols. Men would go as far as dyeing their beards to match their cool, colorful coats. In my personal wardrobe, I had 200 dresses made of silk, satin, and exotic laces. I also wore beads and jewels in my hair, even to bed. I believed in dressing for more than success. I believed in being magnificent. That I was, magnificent in war, magnificent in ruling, including over my sister, magnificent at what matters most, fashion. So now you had the opportunity of hearing my, of hearing bolstering lies from my delightfully dreadful dear sister Mary. But just remember there is only one truth and that is that I was magnificent in every way. Have you ever heard of the Renaissance? The movement known as the Renaissance comes from a French word meaning rebirth. It was inspired by the realism and beauty of an ancient sculpture and architecture, which began in Europe in the 14th century. During this time, the classical cultures of Greece and Rome became the focus of amazing <coughs> artists. I was lucky to have lived during the Renaissance period and mastered many different art forms. In fact, I was considered one of the most renowned artists, sculptors, poets and architects of that time. I had an especially uncommon childhood. I was born in Caprese, Italy on March 6, 1475. When I was less than a month old, my family relocated to Florence. Surprisingly, I did not accompany them. Instead, I lived with a family of stonemasons who exposed me to the art of stoneworking. Interestingly, I later became an unrivaled sculptor and was quoted as saying, I have drunk marble dust with my nurse's milk. Sadly, my mother died when I was six years old. After my father remarried, I returned home to Florence where my affection for art was encouraged. As I was chosen for an art apprenticeship, thus my childhood experiences set the stage for my future masterpieces. As a gifted artist, I ended up developing a passion for learning sculpture. 
Simply, I started with modeling clay because quick because I quickly <coughs> became a proficient because because I quickly became proficient. I impressed many with my early works, such as my carving of Madonna of the Steps and the mythological scene of Battle of the Centaurs. In order to master the art of human anatomy, I eagerly dissected bodies. My favorite material was marble because it could be polished to a beautiful, smooth surface. While in Rome, a French cardinal commissioned me to sculpt a pieta, which was a sculpture of Mary holding the dead body of Jesus. It took me two years, but I completed it in 1499. The Pieta made me famous and was admired by everyone who saw it. In 1504, I sculpted the David in the Florence Cathedral. I loved to sculpt, but if I saw a mistake, it would, it would I would quit the project and start a new one. Because I was a perfectionist, I had many unfinished projects. The statues I completed were unrivaled. In 1508, Pope Julius commissioned me to paint an amazing fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, which told the biblical story of creation. A fresco is an image that has been meticulously painted onto a wall while the plaster is still damp. This was no easy task. No mistakes could be made. It was an honor for me. Remarkably, it took me less than four years to complete. Concerning my next project, Pope Clement VII asked me to paint a picture of the Last Judgment on a gigantic wall behind the altar in the Sistine Chapel. It told the story of the, great, of the second coming of Christ and the final and eternal judgment by God of all humanity. My greatest challenge came when the Pope named me Chief Architect of St. Peter's Basilica in 1546. St. Peter's Basilica is considered one of the most grandiose churches ever built. My masterpiece was the dome. I was old and feeble when I toiled in St. Peter's. A myriad of people agreed that the, that St. Peter's dome was the finest architectural achievement of the Italian Renaissance. Tragically, I died February 18, 1564, was never married, and had no children. My legacy was my sculptures, paintings, and buildings. I was an inspiration towards artists everywhere because they compared their quality to mine. Few could replicate my lifelike drawings or create sculptures with such flawless surfaces. My paintings showed complete mastery. Although there were many great artists during the Renaissance, I surpassed them all. Today, my work is admired all around the world. My name, Michelangelo. It comes to me also, most friends, he captain called Grace and Mal, with three galleys and 200 fighting men. This was a notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland, state Sir Henry Sidney, who had been an English deputy to Ireland. When I was born in 1530 in my parents' remarkable Clear Island Castle on the northern Irish coast, my proud and prosperous parents proclaimed that I had the light of the sea in my eyes. In that moment, they were unaware that their only child and beautiful daughter would eventually become known as the treacherous pirate queen. Although my full and notorious life occurred, on five, occurred 500 years ago, I'm still remembered in many heroic Irish tales told today. Throughout my lifetime, I pursued my one true love, the sea, by sailing the by sailing the coast of Ireland with my father, who taught me everything I needed to know about the sea. Marrying two adventurous men who helped me secure my kingdom and fleet, I also rebelled against the English queen and her men, who desired to destroy everything I loved. As a young lass living in Ireland, I dreamed of sailing, I dreamed of sailing on, the, on the sea and developing a prosperous fleet. Why did I have to stay behind with my mother, whom I love, and accomplish boring tasks at home? I longed for the splendid salt air since my father's family earned their living fishing for salmon, lobster, and herring. I thought I should be on the gallant ship with them. Despite my mother's wishes for raising a proper young maiden who represented the family's wealth, I scoffed and scowled at the idea. Why could my parents not see that I had born, been born braver than lion, stronger than elephant, and a Part of my education included studying Latin. In fact, our family motto was terra mark potent, invisible on land and sea. Once I finally figured out how to tie my first knot, I begged my dad to let me sail with the fleet. My mother and father resolutely stated that my long hair would get t tangled in the riggings. Grumbling, I bolted upstairs and sawed off my hair, which ended up to be short like a boy's hair. 
My little feet gave me a nickname, Grace the Bot. My, my parents laughed and granted me my deepest desire. Yes, Grace, you have earned your place at sea, proclaimed my father. My dream of sailing on the sea at last exploded. For many years I sailed with my father at my side. We happily caught fish for my family. At times we were attacked and I learned how to fight fiercely. Despite my father's wishes for, despite my father's pleas for me to stay hidden below deck, the throw of the battle had been captivated except for the day when I, the, when the exhausting English ra raided my family's beloved castle. On that day, I forgot about being a simple sailor and became an enraged pirate. I, I would not submit to the English rule, nor would I surrender my family's land or fleet. I resolved within myself that I would prob, 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 problem, problem taking, what taking what belong what belonged to the English and making it mine. For many prosperous years, I continued growing a fleet, and the smug English remained at constant in constant pest in our way. At 16, I married. During my marriage, my during my marriage to my husband Donald O'Flaherty, we fought together and built our own wealth. I gave birth to a beautiful baby, Owen. Our marriage quickly ended when Donald was killed in a battle. After his death, I filled my life pursuing control over the, my family's land, lands, land, my family's land, land, and surround, surrounding islands. At this point, I own five castles. I desperately needed control of a sixth castle, Rockfleet Castle, which I considered perfectly placed. Perfectly placed. Rockfleet Castle sat safely inside the Clue Bay of the Northern Island and would be essential to my survival. Because of the castle's location on, and its visibility over the waters, I became relentless of my effort, efforts. I married the castle's owner, Richard Burke. Shortly after our union, Richard rebelled against the English. Together we proclaimed that the greedy and inferior English would not take our land. Hastily, the English trooped outnumbered and rebelled, uh, apprehended me. Rebelled, apprehended me, and sent me to prison. After a year and a half, I was released from Desmo Prison and promised to retire as a, as a pirate. Of course, I had no intention of keeping my promise. Grieving Richard's death, which happened while I was living in prison, while I lived in prison, I marched ahead with the rebel and the rebel and the smug English remained in my land. Queen Elizabeth I of England sent sneering men to Richard Beanham. I took to take my land, to take my land. This fetter man had been determined to destroy me and capture my son Owen. Revenge would be mine. I all but flew down to London to meet the merciless Queen Elizabeth I showed no remorse and ignored her attitude. While using my cunning manners to convince her I was indeed harmless to her, I bellowed that the Irish would stop rebellion if Sir Richard would simply leave us alone. Right after my impressive speech, I sneezed. The queen, the queen handed me her lace handkerchief. I blew my nose noisily and tossed it, the handkerchief in the fire. The queen. The queen, queen's court, court gasped with shock over my insult. Will the queen chop off her head? They all wondered. The queen asked why I tossed the handkerchief in the fire, which I, I stated that the Irish value cleanlessness clean, clean for far too much than putting a dirty hanky, hanky in your pocket. In a pocket. Queen Elizabeth snickered and howled with laughter. She 
granted my demands. I returned to Ireland and continued my life as a pirate. My des my dis I despite my promise and the English the English Queen. Do not judge me too harshly. Queen Elizabeth rebuked me and returned Sneary Sir Richard to finish his efforts and take to take and destroy me. Throughout my lifetime I pursued my one true love VC by sailing the coast of Ireland of Ireland with my father, who taught me everything I needed to know about the sea. Marrying two adventurous men who helped me secure my kingdom and fleet and rebelling against the English queen and her men, who desired to destroy everything I loved. Proudly, my life had been filled with prosperous, um, my life had been filled with purpose to uphold my loyalty to my country. When I died in 1603, I had de defeated all that I loved, defended all that I loved, and lived out my purpose. Although my life had many moments of rebellion, I proved to myself over and over to be braver than lion, stronger than elephant, and here to art. Bravery, loyalty, steadfast dignity are all words people use to describe me. I emerged kicking and screaming from my mother in a hospital on April 15, 1892, Harlem, Netherlands. My mother birthed four children, including me. Unfortunately, my mother died of a horrible sickness. I lamented day after day, hour after hour slowly moving past the lump of grief in my heart. I finally ventured back into my activities, but I expressed no interest in elaborate clothing or worldly entertainment. My father taught me how to love people, however they look, dress, or speak. He emphasized that God made all people equal. In my, when I became older, I held Christian classes for people with special needs at my house. I also became the first licensed girl watchmaker in Harlem to follow the family tradition. During World War II, I hid many Jews in a secret room behind a false wall in my house, later nicknamed the Angel's Den. I also joined a Dutch underground system for, to help people in danger of the Germans. My family installed a buzzer in our house, so if the Nazis invaded, the people hiding in the house would have one minute to get into the hiding place and remove any trace of their presence. This happened often because our family watch shop resided in our house, and German soldiers wanted their clocks fixed frequently. Eventually, a Dutch underground worker betrayed the system and told a police about the secret room. The next day, the Nazis invaded. They found evidence we were hiding Jews. I had the flu at this time and could not walk. After handcuffing us and beating us, they sent us to prison in Skaven again. While in prison, I ate little food, endured overflowing toilets, and slept on hard floors. And after two weeks in prison, I was sent to a hospital where nurses examined us. In a separate room, I could not believe that a nurse asked me if I needed anything. I whispered, a Bible. She murmured back, I will try. A few days later, a small New Testament Bible appeared in my lonely cell between two slices of bread. While the guards were at lunch, I decided to yell a message to my sister. Su suddenly I hear, from Betsy to Corey, I am good, and remember, the Lord is with you, and God is good. I leaped with joy. I also heard that my other two siblings were released. The next day, I received a letter from my older sister, Nolly. It proclaimed, Dear Corey, I need you to be brave. The things you are about to hear are not going to be easy to read. My eyes welled up with tears, but I read on. Father laid in prison for only 10 days and then died of sickness. 
I burst into tears. How can my wonderful father die in a dirty, nasty prison? Now I despise the Germans even more. The next day, I reread the letter and noticed a faint writing on the top corner of the envelope. I remembered the secret code writing we used back at our house. If you dip the envelope in water, one found under the stamp the sec a secret message. So I instantly dipped the envelope in water in the daily water jug and found under the stamp I found all clocks at the house are safe. I knew exactly what it meant. Our hidden Jews had survived in safety. I sobbed with joy. It became the best thing that happened to me in two weeks. After two months in prison, something very interesting happened. All the prisoners in the cells were lined up outside. People whispered, we're finally going to a concentration camp. Other people cried and yelled. The next day, we started toward the concentration camp in trains. Finally, we arrived. My first look proved horrifying. Soldiers were beating hard-working people. I spent a few months there, then traveled to a place called Ravensbrück, where the Germans condemned their most feared enemies. At Ravensbrück, Betsy and I held Christian classes in the bunks. No guards wanted to enter our bunks. They hosted colonies of fleas and lice, an unexpected gift from God. I endured one year of this camp, deeply grieving when God called Betsy home. After the war, I helped people with physical wounds from lots of things, like family losses. I traveled around the world speaking about my life. Altogether, with God's help, my family saved 800 Jews. During this time, I met a Nazi soldier who had no place to live. First, I hated him. Then I learned to forgive all Nazi soldiers and found a place for him to live. Eventually, after I could not see, speak, or walk from five shooks, I died peacefully in my bed on my 93rd birthday, 18, 1983. I remain a symbol of courage, bravery, loyalty, and steadfast dignity. Everyone remembers me as a faithful, loving Cory Ten Boom. I'm not Annalise Johnson. She's sick. I watched the clouds melt away, revealing an unusually bright sun's British rays. A perfect day for flying, I whisper, as my newest secret agent, Nora, walks up to me. I check her clothes and the inside of her plane, making sure everything stays stable on her wild ride. As I fasten a loose weapon back to the side of the plane, I remind Nora that she only has a 50-50 chance of survival even if she successfully infiltrates the German Gestapo. Be brave, I shout, while she zooms away across the English Channel into Nazi-occupied France. Into the bright blue sky, the brave spy flies, just a speck amid the treacherous turquoise world. Born on June 16, 1908, I grew up in Bucharest, Romania. I adored skiing. Desiring to study modern language, I moved to Paris. Traveling to London, I trained at a secretarial college. Suddenly, my father became bankrupt and died in 1933. I traveled to Egypt and met a British pilot named Dick Kitten Crummer and became quite fond of him. Sadly, he died in 1941. I moved back home and stayed with my mom before she also died. Grieved and left without parents, I joined the British SOE, Special Operations Executive. In 1941, I quickly rose to the leadership of 470 spies, including 39 women, who worked as SOE couriers and wireless operators. My most important job was to ensure everything remained secure before a spy lifted off. I confirmed that the spy knew their fake name and fabricated background history in case they got caught. 
I lived an extremely busy life, trying to keep track of all 470 secret agents. Nevertheless, by the end of the war in 1945, 118 spies had failed to return home for unknown reasons. Peace. The word sounded, sounds unreal after years of the vicious World War II. Though peace fills our country once again, I cannot rest. My duty hangs unfinished over my head. I must find every missing agent I looked after. For how can I leave them to rot in unknown lands? I'll finish the job I began and give each of those determined spies the recognition they deserve. Because the SOE shuts down by the end of 1945, I venture to Germany as a woman's auxiliary Air Force squadron officer. I begin my search. Is it true that you killed 1.5 million Jews at the Auschwitz concentration camp? I asked, expecting a truthful answer. Oh no, comes the reply, as if offended. I killed 2.3 million Jews. He holds his wicked head high, as if he accomplished the greatest feat of all time. Rudolf Haas served as a German commander of Auschwitz. He res his response during my interview continues to haunt me. He lived disguised as a farmer until he was arrested and forced to live in the smelly cells of prison. I sigh. All the answers the same, not even a trace of guilt or sorrow. A loud clang rings out as I slam the prison door shut and march out of the dark jail, filled to the brim with wickedness and evil. A tear slides down my cheek. Two million innocent people killed and no way to save them. For a year, I walk back in time following every step of every courageous known agent to her or his horrific death. I interrogate countless commanders of numerous concentration camps, writing every sentence, word, and detail that the commanders admit. I prove such an amazing questionnaire, if I do say so myself, that I helped greatly in the Ravensbrook trials. Eventually, I succeeded in finding the final location of 117 out of 118 daring lost agents. I also found out how 14 of them died. Unfortunately, 12 of these died in miserable concentration camps, while the other two died of disease. Finally, I returned home for a short rest, exhausted and somewhat satisfied. A leader to so many brave agents, an investigator of missing spies, an extraordinary interrogator, from a small Jewish girl to a depressed teenager, eventually a strong, determined woman who never once sold her secret or the secrets of her agents to anybody. I, Vera Mae Atkins, fought for a place in the world, determined to protect my people, even if it meant probable death. I sacrificed a leisurely retirement for decades of relentless effort to remember and honor every noble and brave agent who gave his or her life for the freedom of millions. I raised significant funds for memorials built in memory of numerous agents lost during the war. As my life drew to a close in the year 2000, I saw the clouds of grief melt away into a brilliant pathway toward a joyful reunion with those I admired most. Even though I, Enos Shepherds, was only one of many to live through World War II, every individual had, their, his, had his or her own unique effect during this time of unrest. Soon you are to understand the wild contrast of my life before World War II and during the war. After immigrating to Canada, my husband Hans and I raised seven children and had 22 grandchildren. When I was no longer raising children, I took a long trip across Europe which helped me to get to know Hans better. Growing up in Holland shaped my childhood. My mother was a superb storyteller to my three siblings and I, while my father provided as a banker. Normally, I would ride my bike to school with my friends, where we would sing endless amounts of patriotic songs to our country. My brother's brother, Umyat, lived in the Dutch Indies. Our Umyat was so rich, he sent us videos of himself. I also was on the best rowing team in Europe. Yes, I am proud to say I won the European 
the European Rowing Championships in a dress against my father's will. I never forgot my simple Dutch upbringing. May 10, 1940 was the date when everything changed, striking fear into every citizen of our peaceful country. For the Germans had taken over Holland. Even though World War II was well underway, my, my um Yap was visiting and became trapped with our family because the Germans closed the borders. Things changed after the Germans invaded. Now I could only ride my bike to school if my older brother Leia went with me. Food was growing scarce. After we had already resorted to eating tulip bulbs, I was sent to live on a farm with my younger siblings, where there would be more food available. During this time, Leia was captured, followed by a lucky escape. After I became a little older, self-seeking Germans sometimes asked me out. Eventually, although I had no romantic interest, I would consent to date them. My interest lay in sabotaging any German soldiers I possibly could. See, the German soldiers never expected I would have the courage to push them into the canal after they foolishly had had too many drinks. I never found out if they survived. I just ran. I felt I was part of the underground like my late um -yap. By the end of the war in 1945, I would never have guessed the Germans would oppress us for five long years. While I was still in my 16s and 70s, Hans and I used some of our retirement money for a long trip to Europe, America, and Mexico. But today, I am only going to tell you about Europe, where we began traveling in the fall of 1992. The purpose of our trip was to spend more time together. A massive part of our retirement money went towards a 1993 Volkswagen Eurovan. We named this van Max after a character in Fraggle Rock. We sold the van after our camping trip. During our trip, I made it my job to write down everything. On our adventure, we went to loads of museums. Because we were using our retirement money, we had to be extremely careful, encountering ever-present thieves and staying within our budget. One way we kept our budget was to buy a book at a used bookstore. Then in the next town, we traded it out for a different one. Our trip across Europe ended in the summer of 1993 when we returned home to Canada. When my country, Holland, was independent, I lived a life of normalcy. But during the war, I fought to live a life free of oppression and fear. Later, I daringly used most of my retirement money on a trip to Europe and many other places. As a person, I was shaped by living in Holland, experiencing World War II, and being an immigrant. Thank you so much for listening to these listening so intentively to these great, great creative papers. These students worked so hard and we're so proud to just see the work that they did and have, see their courage to stand up here. I know they were nervous, but it hardly showed. Um, it's just, and even when they stumbled over words, they kept going. It was a great feat to be able to do this. Um, I also want to take a moment to tell you why some of, we start in Middle Ages and go all the way up through Modern times, World War II. Our writing book goes through Middle Ages only, but it, our next cycle focuses on U.S. history. So we kind of leave out a lot of later European history, but these students, a lot of them wanted to delve into that. So we, they, we open that up and they have the opportunity to research that themselves. And um, I think that's just fascinating, all kinds of things that we get to bring in and listen to. So. Let's give another round of applause for our spies and warriors and kings and queens. I also have a few dinner instructions for us. So if you're staying for dinner with us, um, we ask that you go through the line as a family so that those of you who order full portions or half portions for some of your children, you can let the servers know and they can dish it up appropriately. Um, we're going to pray together in here, so if Dr. Cathcart will lead us in prayer, we will be ready to head on downstairs. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for the efforts of these ladies who have done such a diligent job to teach these students this year. Even more, we thank you for the parents who have worked hard to make these papers excellent, and for the students themselves as they have put in much time and effort to prepare. Lord, we thank you, and we are overwhelmed by your hand moving in history. We thank you for your good works of providence, and we thank you for your kindness and your mercy to each one of us. 
Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to live for us, to die for us, and to rise again for us. We pray that you would prepare us now to worship you tomorrow. And before then, may we enjoy sweet fellowship together in the gym. And bless this food to our bodies and our bodies to your service. Thank you for classroom conversations downtown Greenville. Thank you for the blessings you poured out in each of our lives. May we bring glory and honor to your name tonight. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.